So today I want to begin my review of John Mackin's latest paper called A Single Field Model of the Universe. Now, uh, I probably won't be able to review the whole paper, at least not in one shot. So we're just going to start with the abstract, move on to the introduction, and then see how far we get. Now, the reason I like John Mackin's work so much is because um, of all the independent researchers that I've studied, his model, his ideas um, come closer to the ideas that I've collected over the years, the ideas that I um, feel uh, represent are closest to the truth regarding how the, uh, how the universe works. And so here I'm going to start with the abstract. So uh, it starts with... Uh, Lorentz transformations are the foundation of special relativity. However, the currently accepted models of particles in space-time generate Galilean and not Lorentzian transformations. So if you know anything about relativity, you'll know what that means. Okay, Einstein's special relativity postulates, his postulates, which include the invariant speed of light and invari invariant physical laws, are required to insert Lorentz transformations into our physical laws. Several referenced articles show that a sonic universe model derived entirely from a single wave propagation medium okay, would intrinsically exhibit Lorentz transformations. So basically what he's saying here is that a, um, a universe with a uh, that is modeled with a ponderable medium, with a medium that can propagate uh, sonic waves or wave-like uh, phenomenon, um, would also exhibit the Lorentz transformations. And so this, I find this really interesting. I've I always believed this was true. And so um, here are the reference that, references that he's talking about at the end of his paper. Uh, in particular, the sound clocks and sonic relativity, which uh, I just had a quick look at. Um, I haven't read this yet, but um, this is where one of the papers that he's talking about that talks about a, um, a sonic medium um, for the medium for the propagation of light. So, so John Mackin's model models, so he models the quantum vacuum. So the quantum vacuum is modeled as a quantum mechanical sonic medium that propagates waves at the speed of light. So basically he is saying that there is a medium for the propagation of light. And as you may recall, I wrote this paper called A Medium for the Propagation of Light uh, Revisited. And here in this paper, I also talk about I make a comparison between sound waves, sonic waves, and um, the um, potential for a medium for the propagation of light. And so I introduce this equation here, which is the equation used to calculate the speed of sound through a material medium. Um, and I'm not talking about air here, okay? I'm talking about this could be any medium that propagates waves, any solid, any mo uh, medium that is made up of atoms. Okay, so this could be a cube of salt, this could be a diamond, this could be water, this could be um, your body. Okay, your body is also a medium for the propagation of waves. And so the other reason I'm really interested in this line of thinking is because my area of expertise is in the field of 3D ultrasound. And so for the past 30 years, I've been working in this field. And so I do have a good understanding of how ultrasound works. Okay, and so ultrasound, ultrasound treats your body as if it is a medium. Okay, so your body, <clears throat> just like some and some other sort of uh, medium solid um, body or jello or, you know, that kind of, of medium, a medium that has elasticity and is made of um, atoms, of particles. And so... Um, the, so the ultrasound is a non-invasive diagnostic technique used to image inside the body. Ultrasound probes, so they're using ultrasound, okay? So ultrasound probes called transducers produce sound waves that have frequencies above the threshold of human hearing, so above 20 kilohertz. 
but most transducers are in the megahertz range. And so I deal with transducers that are, you know, 5 megahertz, 12 megahertz. We're getting high into the 20 megahertz range uh, for these ultrasound transducers, okay? So um, so the you place the, the ultrasound transducer on the skin, and that creates the coupling. So that is to couple the uh, sound waves that are coming out of the transducer to the skin, and the sound waves you know, go into the body and bounce back. And that is how these um, ultrasound images are created. And it's more complicated than that. But uh, the main point here is that, um, you know, that John Mackin is talking about a uh, ponderable medium, sorry about that, a, a sonic medium, a sonic universe. Okay, so that is one of the reasons I like this model so much is because it looks very much like what I was trying to say <clears throat> in my paper called the medium for the propagation of light because I'm injecting the idea of sound waves in a material medium into um, the my theory into my into the idea into so I, I have a hard time with the word theory because it's not my theory it is just a bunch of ideas that I pulled together that I think are closest to the truth in terms of how the universe works. Okay, so um, this is the single universal field. He calls it a universal field. Um, I refer to mine as the universal medium or the original medium, um, OM for short, that generates everything. So in the model that I'm proposing, is identical to this in that um, everything that we observe in the universe emerges from the universal, he calls it a field, I call it a medium, we're talking about the same thing, okay? So all particles, all forces, and all natural laws emerge from this sonic universe, sonic medium, or universal field as he calls it, okay? This field slash medium is described, quantified, and tested. It is shown to be capable of generating a wave-based electron and has an electrons that has the electrons energy, spin, wave properties, and rest mass while having no detectable volume. Okay, so most important, the model also generates an electron's gravitational and electrostatic forces. These forces are transmitted through a distortion of the universal field, the medium for the propagation of these sonic waves, rather than the exchange of messenger particles as in the standard model. So the derived electrostatic force is a first order wave effect and the gravitational force is a much weaker nonlinear second order wave effect. This model shows the electron's gravitational and electrostatic forces are closely related when they're modeled as wave effects in the sonic universe. This close mathematical relationship is proven in section five. Okay, so that's basically the abstract of this paper. He is modeling particles. Uh, he is modeling uh, the universe as a medium. He's saying this the universe is a medium and that all particles, everything we observe, the particles, the, um, the forces, and um, other such effects as magnetic and electrostatic effects emerge from this uh, medium, from the medium of the propagation of light. So that is exactly what I've been proposing. And so that is why I like uh, John Mackin's model. And so who is John Mackin? John Mackin is a former member. He was on the board of trustees of St. Mary's College of California, but more importantly, he is a retired laser physicist. Okay, and so uh, I think he is um, uniquely qualified to understand light and light theory and um, other such things. And so uh, he uh, was president of two laser related companies, which he started. Okay, so um, his current project proposes the quantum vacuum has properties of universal field. Okay, that's what he's working on right now. That's, uh, that's what this paper is all about. Okay, so introduction. This article proposes a model of the universe based on a single quantifiable field medium 
that propagates waves at the speed of light. Support for this medium has come from a remarkable series of technical articles, the ones that I showed you, that imagine a thought experiment of a hypothetical universe based on sound waves. In this thought experiment, this sonic universe is filled with a medium that propagates sound at the sonic speed um, speed of light, or at a speed, not speed of light, but the speed of the sonic medium. These articles assume everything observable in this hypothetical, hypothetical universe is made of sound waves. For example, quasi-particles are formed by spherical standing sound waves. So particles are standing sound waves. The point of these articles is not to describe these sonic quasi-particles, but to imagine the physics of a universe based on the foundation of a single universe sound propagating field model. Particles would be sonic quasi-particles and forces would be transmitted through the medium. Okay, so he is an imagining, imagining that there is a medium for the pro propagation of the light, but the medium itself um, is, uh, supports the quasi-particles, so the quasi-particles emerge from the medium, the sound waves emerge from the medium, and of course the particles um, communicate with each other through the sonic medium. For example, the thought experiments imagine rulers made of sonic quasi-particles and the clocks are resonant sonic clocks analogous to Einstein's light clocks. Mathematical analysis in these articles proves that the hypothetical instruments made of standing sound waves with particle-like properties would indicate the measured speed of sound is constant in all reference frames. So this medium would have the same uh, properties of, um, of the, uh, what uh, we learn about in relativity uh, in terms of reference frames. Okay, this occurs because sonic instruments and sonic clocks undergo perfect Lorentz transformations when moving relative to the privileged rest, rest frame of the sonic medium. Amazingly, this privileged rest, this privileged, I can't say it, this privileged rest frame is proven to be undetectable by the instruments made of sonic quasi-particles. So if you did a michelson morley experiment in this sonic medium, if all your instruments were made of um, sonic quasi-particles, then the michelson morley experiment would produce a null result. Okay, so michelson morley experiment built in this sonic medium using sonic, so the quasi-particles, the particles are made of the emerge from or part of the sonic medium, then um, they would experience uh, the Lorentz contraction, the Lorentz, and, and they would behave exactly as we observe that we measure in our universe using um, the formulas in relativity. So then he goes on to talk about these uh, four articles that are the first four articles referenced in this uh, paper. So in uh, the first article, so a real Lorentz uh, Fitzgerald contraction, in this article, Borsello and Jans propose a thought experiment of a hypothetical universe based on a mass massless scalar field with properties of a perfect sonic medium. Particles are visualized as sonic quasi-particles or solitons. Okay, this uh, word will be used uh, uh, to mean the quasi-particles and in this sonic field or in this uh, sonic medium, okay? They ask the question, is an inertial observer capable of discerning whether he is at rest in the medium or moving through it at a certain uniform velocity? To answer this question, they propose the sonic equivalent of a Michelson-Morley experiment. They show that the physical length um, of the quasi-interferometer arm, as measured, as measured in the lab using acoustic instruments, would shrink by an acoustic Lorentz factor um, of this uh, equation here. Okay, so the gamma factor can be applied in this circumstance uh, when moving at a velocity v with respect to the medium. 
Okay, so in other words, the acoustic universe model achieves not only a constant speed of sound, analogous to our constant speed of light, but it is also possible, it is also impossible to detect motion relative to the medium using an interferometer incorporating sonic quasi-particles and the associated forces. So if the interferometer itself is made of the sonic medium, if it is a um, emerges from, if it is a manifestation of the uh, acoustic sonic medium, then it would also experience the length contractions and the um, likely the uh, inertial mass increases that we associate with relativity. So the second article, um, Sonic Clocks and Sonic Relativity, in this article, they describe a thought experiment in which sonic observers possess devices called sound clocks that are analogous to Einstein's light clocks. Motion relative to the chains of these sonic clocks are shown to undergo relative, uh, relativistic length contraction and time dilation. Uh, the article states that the uh, moving observers perceive the stationary sound clock chains to be length contracted and time dilated as exactly as one would expect from a naive application of rel the relativistic formula with C being the speed of sound instead of the speed of light. So again, they're able to replicate the effects of relativity and the uh, length contraction and the uh, time dilation, which is really clock retardation. So time dilation really means that clocks slow down in case um, you don't uh, know that. Okay, so time dilation is kind of a weird term. I'd never really liked it. I prefer to use clock retardation. So the, these sound clock chains are, uh, are found to be length contracted and their clocks slow down uh, when they are moving relative to the medium for the propagation of these sound waves. And so the third article, Why Not a Sound Postulate, is an attempt to disprove the contentions of the previous two. So this article essentially states all the objections to um, the ether, to a medium for the propagation of light. And so, for example, the article states that there is no em empirical evidence there is no empirical evidence for a sound medium, and there must be some physical phenomenon that is a function uh, of the state of the medium that we can detect, I'm assuming is what they mean. And so, um, but you can't, there is no experiment you can do that uses a, um, phys that uses particles that are made, themselves made up of the, um, of the medium, of the sonic medium. There is no experiment you can do to get this in empirical evidence that they're talking about here. So in order to get empirical evidence, you have to be able to do an experiment to detect that. And what um, they talked about in these previous two articles is that um, you cannot detect the medium. And that doesn't mean the medium doesn't exist. It just means that we cannot build an experiment to detect it because any experiment you build has to be made of particles, quasi-particles, which are, uh, which emerge from the sonic medium. That's kind of like closing your eyes and saying, um, because I can't see it, it doesn't exist. If eyesight was your only organ, if eyes were your only organ, and eyesight was your only way of um, detecting the universe, and then you closed your eyes, there would be no way of you telling uh, whether the universe even existed or not. And so that's kind of what I think that they're they're saying here. And so the fourth article uh, disputes some of the arguments of the previous article. So this is fourth article disputes what they said in this third article. And uh, so um, Shanahan shows that wave-based elementary particles are in the sonic universe do a good job of explaining the physical origin of the Lorentz transformation. So uh, he's saying this is a good way of um, proving the that uh, you require that the Lorentz transformation exists and however other explanations are still possible. So 
Uh, he concludes, it would, th it would thus seem prudent to regard the existence or otherwise of this medium as an open question. So because we can't build an experiment to detect it, we can never know for sure whether it exists or not. But in my opinion, if having a medium produces a better model, a more understandable model, a more teachable model than not having a medium, then I think it's a good idea to uh, have a medium and or do it both ways and see which one, um, you know, wins basically. So then John goes on to say, okay, this sonic universe concept does such a good job explaining Lorentz transformations and the other mysteries of special rel relativity that it should be developed further to see if it can be expanded into a more complete model corresponding to our universe. So this is a really great idea. To really validate this concept, it's necessary to assume space-time space is a massless sonic medium and deduce its sonic properties, okay? Then it's necessary to invent a sonic quasi-particle uh, of an electron derived from the sonic medium. And finally, this electron model needs to be tested to see if it achieves um, the electron's key pro properties. The electron model described in this article successfully achieves the electron's energy, spin, and wave properties, electrostatic force, and gravitational force. Therefore, the conclusion is that this article shows the sonic universe model can generate a plausible model of an electron. Most uh, surprisingly, the model also makes predictions about the existence of a previously unrecognized relationship between the electrostatic and gravitational forces. So this is something that I always thought because the equation for the electrostatic uh, force and the gravitational force are so similar, um, you can't help but wonder if they are associated in uh, some way. And so he says this exercise is shown to generate a useful alternate model of the universe with predictive powers. So here is John Mackin's electron model, okay, which I showed in a previous video or maybe more than one video. Um, so he models the electron as a standing wave. And now the standing wave, at the center of the standing wave, you have this um, vortex here. Uh, this is a hill. This is a valley. This is a hill. This is a valley. And um, I use the yin yang as a schematic for this, where the black going towards white represents a hill and the white going towards black represents the valley. So these are the, these two come from John Mackin's uh, research paper. And uh, this you can clearly see if you could imagine that it is spinning either clockwise or counterclockwise here. He is showing a clockwise spin. Here I am showing a clockwise spin. And you, these are two representations. This is a physical representation and this is a temporal representation. And so I incorporate uh, both the physical and, and temporal representation in this one uh, schematic here. And so again, this is one of the reasons why I really like John Mackin's work. He gave me the missing piece of the puzzle in terms of interpretation of the yin yang schematic as a hill and a valley. And there may be, you know, other ways of interpreting this, but this is a nice way to interpret it. I always interpret it as a vortex anti-vortex pair that are coupled in, uh, that are coupled in the medium. Um, and so that is, uh, I still uh, will often refer to this as a vortex anti-vortex pair where the, this is the uh, one vortex and this is another vortex, although this is really just one vortex and this is really one vortex. Okay. So the vortex anti vortex pair in itself is really just one vortex. And so hopefully that's not too confusing. Um, there are, these are clearly paired. They're definitely paired and each one in itself could be a vortex. So there could be a vortex spinning in here and there could be a vortex spinning in here, which is not represented in the schematic, but that is something that, um, that was seen in the John Fleischmann Memorial Project, Bob Greener's 
research, he uh, shows a yin yang, uh, a dynamic kind of like this, where there's a hill and a valley, but he is also seeing um, clockwise spin in, at the in, at the top of the hill and counterclockwise spin at the bottom of the valley, or vice versa. And so um, there's a lot of ideas. There's a lot. This is sort of an action-packed bunch of images that uh, tell a very interesting story, in my opinion. So there's another independent researcher whose work I've been following for a while. And uh, so that would be David Toom, Frederick David Toom. So he um, has been working on his double helix electron positron pair ether. And so um, there are a lot of researchers that do talk about electron positron pairs in various configurations. So here he's got a DNA like um, image, a DNA like figure. I, he, uh, I find this figure in all the papers that he's written. And so this is how he is depicting um, the uh, helix, um, double helix, electron positron pair model of the ethers. So I will leave a link to this as well in the description so you can have a look. Um, and maybe I will review this at some point. But uh, so just this idea, this electron positron pair uh, has been coming up time and time again. There's Ernest Sternglass who wrote a book called Before the Big Bang. And he talks about the universe starting with a relativistic electron positron pair that goes through a series of cell divisions before um, ponderable matter before electron, like actual uh, particles like electrons and protons and atoms uh, emerge from the ether. So he had a very similar idea as well. And there's also the group that um, talks about the EPOLA model, E-P-O-L-A, the EPOLA model. That is a, a medium made of electron positron pairs. Okay, so I think I'm going to leave it at that. I think um, I will try to continue to, I'm not going to make any promises, but I'm going to continue to uh, review John's paper and um, hopefully at some point, hopefully I'll get through it. Uh, it's kind of long. I'm just going to kind of bring you through this really quickly. Um, it's uh, quite a long paper and if I were to read the whole thing, it would take quite some time. And so I am going to leave it a link to it in the description and you can read it yourself and then uh, as I continue to make videos on this paper on John's work then you can hopefully be informed and ask me questions or we can have a discussion about it and uh, and go from there. So I'm, uh, I've had, had been quite busy this summer with working and taking vacation and working on my NFT project and so I'm happy to get back to making the videos and hopefully trying to keep uh, the promises that I've made to you in the past in terms of reviewing certain work and uh, continuing uh, with my research. So um, have a good day and uh, I'll be back.